Okay, welcome to this bonus section of the course, Amazon Free R Tests. We're going to show you how to use this on the ESP32. I would have put out this lecture earlier because I've actually already done this over a month ago on the Windows Simulator as well as the TI3220SF, but I wanted to wait until they made it compatible with the ESP32, which they finally did about 10 days ago. So that's going to make our life a lot easier than having me have you go out and buy a new microcontroller that's like 50 bucks, like the TI-1, or use the Windows emulator, which requires you to download Visual Studio, which is a big, huge piece of bloated software, and then connect it via Ethernet, which I didn't like because I want to use a Wi-Fi connection. So sorry for the delay, but let's talk about what this free RTOS is how you would want to use it, and then we're going to talk about how to set up the environment. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about the exact code, but that'll be really briefly. Now, as far as this course has been going, again, this course is a fusion between hardware and software. It's device to cloud integration. So for the device side guys, all the cloud stuff and the web stuff is kind of new. So before I get started with this lecture, I'm going to say right offhand, this more than anything else I've covered in this course, is heavily hardware focused. Just by the nature of the beast, we're talking about an operating system for microcontrollers. And they're a specific kind of microcontroller. So when Amazon says IoT operating system for microcontrollers, that's not super accurate because we need to talk for a second about what really is viable is what microcontrollers you really be using with this. So if you have an Arduino 8-bit microcontroller or even up to say an ESP8266 or ARM Cortex-M0, you're not going to be able to run free RTOS. Those systems are too confined memory size to use this operating system. Now on the other side of the equation, if you're using a Raspberry Pi with a Cortex-A53 or an application level processor, you're going to be using Greengrass or you're just going to be using the operating system, Noobs, Debian, BDS, whatever came on that SBC, that single board computer with that application processor. So again, you're not going to be using free RTOS. So you can watch this video and kind of go over what Amazon markets their free RTOS as, but I'm just telling you it has kind of a narrow sector on where you'd want to use it. However, having said that, free RTOS is a big deal. I think it was a very good move for Amazon to buy free RTOS and make it now AWS free RTOS. So in the embedded world, we've worked with Micron free RTOS, a few of these different kind of free real-time operating systems for microcontrollers. And what they do is they give us a bunch of free built-in functions we can use above the bare metal SDK programming level of the board. So that's the really good use of an operating system that will translate across different microcontrollers, usually in that ARM Cortex M3, M4 range, that we don't have to write bare metal code that's going to be completely different in each microcontroller and we have to address different memory spaces. So there's a huge advantage if we have a larger program that requires an operating system to have a common operating system across different brands of microcontrollers. So Amazon bought this, improved the TCP IP stack to connect with Amazon and made it an Amazon specific operating system. Now I didn't say a real time operating system because as soon as you get into web cloud you're no longer real time. But at least on the board level you can use these semaphores and these root scheduling tables that give you those elements of real time on the microcontroller level. But you can read over the Amazon documentation and come up with your own conclusion. But overall I think it was very smart for Amazon to buy this product. They probably picked it up fairly cheap but having said that, it's a very low-level hardware programming product, so most people in this course are just going to want to go over this example, understand what it's about, and then forget about it. You're not going to really want to program low-level C unless you're doing commercial development. So anyways, going on, these are the companies that are partners. There's only a few of them. You see five. There used to be four until two weeks ago, and finally, Espresso has been promising it for a while. They made the ESP32 compatible with AWS Free RTOS, so that's good news. But all these are kind of M Cortex M3, M4 level boards. And you can also use the Windows simulator if you don't own any of these boards, but I don't suggest that. It works pretty well. I've used it. I find this Texas Instruments board, again, that SF3220 to be very good. But for this lecture, we're going to cover the Espressif board. So the Espressif board is here. Here's the pictures of the only compatible boards right now you can use AWS Free RTOS with. This is the board we're going to be using. You've been using this throughout the course. We'll go into that in the next section. And Amazon documentation is excellent for this, but I just wanted to walk through it with you and you can read this as well. We'll talk about plugging in your ESP32 and going over setting up the operating environment. 
Okay, so at this point for the second section, let's just go through the getting started guide on how to set up this ESP32 board to run the free RTOS operating system and communicate with the AWS cloud. So coming over here, we're using this device. If you're using one of these other devices, just go ahead and click on that device specific getting started guide. I'm just gonna open a new tab here. So I'll tell you already right off the top, that using the ESP board instead of the TI board or the Windows console has one big disadvantage and one big advantage. The disadvantage is that you have to set up this MSYS32 operating environment. It's like its own Unix-based programming environment, and you don't have to do that with the Windows simulator program, and you don't have to do that if you use the TI3220 SF board. You also don't have to do it if you're using the STM node board, which I've also used. But for the ESP, it's required that you do that. That's the bad news. It's an extra step, and I think that file is like a gigabyte and a half, so it's the MSYS32 operating environment for programming. It's pretty large. Now the good news is that unlike with what I've previously mentioned with these other boards in the Windows simulator, you don't have to create your own certificates and policies to attach to those certificates. So if you remembered when we used the MQTT tool, we had to create our certificates and a policy and then put them over to the program so it recognized where those PEM and certificate files were. But when we use Xerneth and Mongoose, it did it for us. So again, with the TI board or the STM board or the Windows simulator, we have to create policies and certificates. But the good news is with the ESP board in that environment, they have a program that auto-generates our policies and those certificates which the policies are attached to. So the bad news is we have to download the program and install it. But the good news is we don't have to deal on the cloud side with making certificates and policies and importing those over to our boards or programs. So the first thing we need to do because of the certificate issue is install the MSYS32 system. Now we've already done in the getting started guy, we've already set up our environment and set up our hardware. We've already done that previously in the course. So you can start here with setting up your tool chain relative to you have Windows, Mac, or Linux. So I'm just gonna open a new tab for getting started here with Windows. So just go ahead and follow these directions. And the first thing you need to do is download this combined file. You don't have to do it this way. You can set up an Eclipse editor and make a bunch of pathing to it with the bare metal file paths. I don't recommend you guys do that. This is an all-in-one zip file that'll give you the environment as well as all the folders you'll need for AWS IoT in the file. So just use this and download it and it'll tell you how to install the MSYS32, start it up and get going in this Unix-like development environment and create an additional ESP folder. So you'll be able to get up to this point and stop and then return back to the original getting started guide, not this expressive ESP32 specific starting guide. But now that we're done with this and we've installed this environment, let's go back here and go down to the next step. And it tells you how to navigate in these files. So we've already installed the normal CLI in the course, but easy install is PIP, but in the MSYS32 environment. So go ahead and reinstall the AWS CLI in this MSYS32 environment, and you would have to put the, your endpoint, we've already done all this when we used the MQTT FX tool or any of these other programs in the console, your Wi-Fi SID, your password, if you have a normal router using WPA2 security. And of course, just like Xerneth, this uses Python 2.7, so go ahead and make sure, maybe this one can use 3.0 as well, but make sure that's installed. You'll know you'll get an error if you try to do this and you don't get anything. This is what Espressif does. This is not an Amazon specific thing. This is a Espressif specific thing. They need this Python environment for how they set up their configuration. And from there, you can kind of go on to the menu config. And when you bring up this menu config, it'll make sure you know what COM port you're on if you're using Windows or TTY if you're using Mac. This is a little utility that you'll save the right COM port. And then finally you'll flash it and you'll get all these things over here. So let's go ahead and do that now. I'm just gonna go ahead to this base folder over here and flash, I'm gonna actually start here and make sure I have the menu config. So 
I'm going to go back here and make sure I'm in the right folder. Now your file configuration is going to be different than mine. So I have to go back to the base directory because I need to use not what's in this MIGWIN32 issue, but over what's in my Amazon specific file. So going back to my base directory in this Ming32 shell is not cd dot dot, but c slash c. So that brings me to my root directory. All right, so let's do this now. CD menu configured. This will bring up my menu. I was using a different device that was on COM10, so I do need to change this back. I want to go to serial flasher config, hit that. And again, I'm not at 10, so I'm going to select this one and I'm on COM4. Now, I screwed this up once earlier. I got to make sure I save this, so I have to hit OK. And I got to hit save. If I just exit here, it won't save. So now I hit save, OK. Now I can exit. And now I'm on COM4. Now I can exit again. And then the last thing I have to do now that I have that all set up is to go to my last command here, which is actually flashing it over. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to do one more thing before I install this command or actually as I'm doing it. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this in here. This takes a long time to build this. So let's start building it. That's going to start building. I'll go back to that in a second, but I need to go to my Amazon account, log into it and set a topic because what's in that file is going to be a specific topic. Actually, I'm going to log in here on my Google thing because it's already set up on Chrome. So I'm going to use that instead of Firefox. And I'm sure that thing's still going. So again, it's called IoT Core now. When I started the course, it was just called IoT something else. Now it's IoT Core. And I'll go back here and I think this is still, yeah, this is going to be building for a while. This takes a while the first time you build it up. So let's go over to test. And we put up in our topic. Now, the Amazon documentation was a little bit deficient. It didn't actually say what the topic was we're subscribing to in free RTOS. But the good news is it's the same topic for every single demo program. So the topic is free RTOS demos echo. And what it's basically going to say is hello and hello acknowledged. So I'm just going to paste that in there. Subscribe to this topic. And as soon as the program starts, this will start giving us a response down here. So let's go back here and wait for this program to finish. It goes finally. All right, so let's just start outputting information here, connecting if we have the right topic in here. And there it goes. I made one modification that you'll see in a second. So normally the first time you run this, it'll give you a limited number of responses. I think it'll give you 10 of these. It'll say, hello world. I added the ESP32 just to make sure I was in the right file directory, acknowledge, and it'll count down from 1 to like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, alternate, or 1 to 0. Now, because I altered it, it's kind of an error with the code, not my problem. And I figured out that it's either because the optimization flags the second time optimize out to delay incorrectly, or there's a certain buffer length. And if you exceed the buffer length, it doesn't terminate the loop properly. But this actually shouldn't happen to you, but it doesn't even matter if it does, because the main point is that it's connecting to AWS and we know everything's working. So the last thing I kind of want to do is look at those files. But again, this is a professional embedded tool. So the only people that are really going to be wanting to use free RTOS or if you're doing really commercial development. For this course, most of you guys are just exploring it and doing prototyping. That's why I recommend using Mongoose or Xerinth. Or if you have a Raspberry Pi, you use the AWS IoT SDK. So I just wanted to introduce you to how this works and show you that it actually does. And for professional embedded development tool and environment, this is the easiest tool and documentation I've ever seen to get starting with because for most bare metal development for cloud connectivity, way more difficult than what we're doing in the Getting Started Guide. And remember, I skipped a couple steps in this Getting Started Guide. You still have to do the Python thing. You still have to put all this information in your JSON packet folder and do a couple more things, but they're all pretty easy and I'll probably be able to help you out if you get stuck. Now, the very last thing I want to do before we finish this additional bonus section is go over a couple of these files that are in here and how they kind of did the file structure of AWS Free RTOS when you download it from the AWS site. And that's explained how to do that again in this Getting Started Guide. So if I go to the free AWS part of it, I kind of dig in here and see what's going on. And it has these specific vendor modules. Now, if I go over to the common one, the one I'm looking for and the two files I want to go over to are the main 
and the specific file where we're getting our topic and outputting hello world. Strangely enough, that's kind of hidden. It's not that easy to find, but where Amazon put it is under the common files, MQTT. And this is the exact same file, whether you're using an ST board, an NXP board, a TI board, or the Spressif board. They share this exact same file. So they did a good job making it a generic file. So let's open this one up. I'm going to open it up with Notepad. I don't want to wait for Microsoft code to load. It just takes too long. So I added in this ESP32 so I knew where it was coming from, but this would say ESP32 if I was using the TI, NXP board, or ST board, or even the Windows emulator, just so you know. But you can play around with this code, but again, I just wanted to show you this. This is pretty low-level bare metal C, but it's calling these free RTOS functions which are now part of Amazon Free RTOS, which are real-time functions. So it gives you more of this high-level availability of some built-in functions. And you still have all the functions available you get from the C library and the standard C and all these things. But here it calls in the Free RTOS library, as well as some AWS-specific libraries they added after they bought Free RTOS. So you can add another topic here. So here's a topic we're using that you've already seen, but you can add a separate topic, make your own publishing topic to publish to the AWS cloud. But it's not really that easy because if you go down here to where it says hello world, it actually has something called the C buffer and that's a certain buffer length. So when I was playing around with this and I tried to say, oh, humidity and temperature and uh, I can generate a random number as part of the standard C library, that wasn't difficult but it's pretty easy to exceed this buffer length, this data length and the C buffer. So it's not just a matter of going in and changing it. These are all related to packet size that can be transmitted. So it gets very complicated very quickly. So again, unless you're a professional embedded programmer, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty difficult for you to start altering a lot of these underlying functions and libraries, just to let you know. But if you want to try more power to you, it'd be a great learning experience. So this is where it outputs Hello World, and I believe it does the acknowledgement from the connect up here once it connects back on the callback. That's one of the two files I wanted to show you. The only other one I want to show you before we end all this is this the main file. So if I come back down here to demos and go into the Espresso specific folder that you downloaded to the common application code, here's the main one. And this one is the ESP32 specific file, unlike the previous one. I'm just gonna change it here to open it with something else. All right, yeah, I had to change that. Somehow the Microsoft code got corrupted. I forgot about that. I might download that or I might not. Even the Microsoft code, which is our non-development environment, is somewhat bloated. So I like using this Notepad++, but you might have any kind of editor you want. It doesn't matter. So this is the ESP specific code for the main. It doesn't give you a lot of ability to change it easily. So here we we have our ESP specific calls and then down here the main is going to look pretty small. There's an entire main function right here. That's all you get. Just kind of auto starting a bunch of functions. And if you want to change kind of the guts of how this program works as a professional development, you're going to have to go in here and mess with all this stuff and then go ahead and mess with all these different libraries that are called. So again, a professional development tool, but it's something cool to know, easy to get started with if you want to print Hello World and have some basic functionality. And I hope this has been useful for some of you hardware guys that are interested in a more advanced development tool for device to cloud integration.